Today's guest is Dr. Sarah Mednick. She is a sleep researcher down at University of California, Irvine, and we explore why sleep is so important. We also explore this topic of the down state. What is it? How can it enhance recovery? We also discuss naps. Why is it so important to nap? When is the best time of the day to nap? A lot of really cool topics. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys do too, but most importantly, stay safe and be well. So I think a great place to start would be for you to define for us and everybody else um, what the upstate and the downstate is. Yeah. Yeah. So the downstate's a term I came up with that really encapsulates all of the restorative practices that we can engage in on a daily basis to keep ourselves replenished and restored. And the idea is based on that we are rhythmic and rhythms, we can actually put the, uh, the first slide up if you want, which is that we have these rhythms that give us time where we have peak energy, which I call the upstate, where we're able to have you know, an output of energy. We have all the glucose we need. We have all the ATP we need. Our, all of our systems are uh, primed and ready for output. And then it, what follows is, because that's very energy depleting, what's followed is a period called the down state, which is when we go into energy conservation mode and energy replenishment mode. And it's where we have protein synthesis occurring. We have a re um, relaxation of our heart rate. We have a slowing of breathing. <clears throat> we basically just decrease the energy expenditure of all of our systems and it allows us to also just build up our energy stores because the very next moment comes the next upstate, right? So Rhythms mean that they just continue going in upstates and downstates and upstates and downstates. And you need both sides. And now throughout a day, um, there'll be multiple upstates and downstates. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically, our, our systems do have multiple upstates and downstates. But we live in a society that really tries to pack too much into the upstate, right? Where we actually, you know, are we eat too much sugar, right? We eat so much... Um, food that makes our metabolic upstate so huge that we don't have, that we're not giving enough time to really processing the food, giving ourselves, to, uh, giving the, um, the, our metabolic states long breaks so they can kind of recover from all of that eating. Same thing with our heart rate. We have increasing heart rates at the beginning of the day, and then our heart rates stay really, really high for too long. We have these very long, stressful days. And then we expect basically, you know, the nighttime to be the one time where we're decreasing our heart rate. And that's not enough time, right? That we actually need more opportunities to have a balance between these sort of high stress states and these recovery states. Yeah, I think, and we were talking about this before, sort of society pushes us to really pack in as much upstate as possible, right? And certainly with like working from home, for example, that's, you know, I always thought about, you know, people are able to compartmentalize their work from their home, you know, when they get back from work, for example, they can rest and, and sort of be in that down state versus now um, with sort of this remote work, you know, when does work end, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it even was before the pandemic because, with the cell phones that now have your your boss can you know, basically text you at any hour and that idea of always on culture means that you know there isn't there didn't used to be that right like we would come home from work and the job would be over there and we would be home and Walter Cronkite would give us like just half an hour of of news and that was it people didn't have social media and looking at the horrible news global climate change the war in Ukraine you didn't have constant filtration of all the horrors of the day filling into your home life and that kind of time where you're supposed to be kind of checking in with your cave mates and just tuning all the functions down so now we have these long periods of being in high anxiety, high stress states, oh wait, you know, doctors who are on call, they don't get good rest, right? It's only when you're off, not on call that you can actually get into sleep because you're always in a state of arousal. And that's what 
you know, basic human beings are now dealing with. Yeah. And I like to think about things evolutionarily, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, when we weren't sort of in the societal construct where, you know, your boss can text you or you have social media on your phone, or even if you have Walter Cron Cronkite, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, but if you have him like on the TV, you know, giving you all the, all the day's bad news, you know, evolutionarily, like, you know, thousands of years ago, that just wasn't present. Right. right. So some of these natural upstate downstate functions were um, there wasn't anything really interfering with that necessarily. Right. I mean, if you look at animals, right, who are not controlling their environment with light and with work schedules and with, you know, social media, they don't have chronic disease. Right. They don't have problems sleeping. They go into their states of downstate naturally and then when the sun rises they go into their upstate and then when the sun goes down they go back in their downstate and and it's only humans that have learned to prolong the upstate by all of these different changes in our environment that have gotten us out of our natural cycles yeah um so tell me what is the consequence of this imbalance between too much upstate and too little downstate I mean, the short answer is we have increasing rates of chronic disease, right? But I mean, if you think about the amount of um, people are spending too much time indoors, they're spending about 90% of their hours indoors. Um, they are more sedentary than ever, right? They are more, um, they're eating foods that are high processed, high fat, high sugar foods, right? Um, and um, we're commuting longer hours, we're working longer hours, right? And all of this is leading to a system that's out of balance. And when your system is out of balance, what you are denying yourself are these nice long periods where you can shut down your stress responses and shut down all your active responses and go into replenishment mode. When you're out of balance, you're not doing that, right? So basically, you're keeping the lights on way longer than they need to be and you're depleting the system that it's you know i think about the metaphor of a wave crashing there's always a the wave crashes and then it needs to draw inward to gain energy and then it crashes again and then it draws inward to gain energy and then it crashes again but when we are not giving ourselves that inward drawing in or that downstate, it's like a wave that's trying to crash and crash and crash and crash. So we run out of energy. We keep ourselves at very high heart rate levels. We keep our cortisol levels, our stress levels really high. What that means is on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't get into deep sleep. Um, we don't get, you know, increases in all the good things that happen with slow wave sleep, which is like, you know, growth hormone is really only increases during slow wave sleep. We don't have the decreases in our heart rate, so we have increased rates of um, hypertension, which leads to cardiovascular disease. What we see is people who are not able to have nice long downstates and get into deep sleep. They have increased weight gain, they have metabolic disorders, um, increased risk for diabetes. You know, older adults, we have data looking at older adults and how when they get into sleep, you know, what does their sleep look like? And what we find is that they just don't get that deeply restorative sleep. And what does that lead to? Increased rates of frailty, right? Increased falling, that kind of, you know, that this non-robust system that it just seems, as we said before, that is kind of like a one-way street that it's like aging is just a full-on deterioration. So I think we have very fast aging but an older population. So it's actually very costly as well. So, and we're gonna get, I think, the, uh, a lot finer detail in regards to all that in a minute, but um, can we go over the sort of role of the autonomic nervous system into this whole upstate, downstate thing? Yeah, so there's another slide that might also be nice to just pull up, um, and you can just go all the way through two clicks. There we go, yeah, thanks, perfect, okay. So um, when I started doing research, everybody was really focused on the brain, um, and that was in the late 90s. And then 
Um, and that was the decade of the brain. <laughs> I don't know what decade we're in now, but that was the beginning of really I think thinking about. Brain. I know. I might be biased. But... <laughs> I think that people are really still focused on the brain. But when I and 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 the way we measure brain activity is via EEG, which you can see here. Um, but what's also true is that we are more than just a brain. We're also a body, and we have two different nervous systems. We have multiple, but. The two major ones are the central nervous system, which is attached, which is really the, the, the cortex and the cerebral cortex and everything, subcortex. Um, and then we have the autonomic nervous system, which is regulating all of our organs and our body. Um, and we can really um, measure the autonomic nervous system with uh, ECG because it's a great reflection of how your autonomic nervous system is doing is your heart rate um, when you're stressed out. Uh, well, let's just say the autonomic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight system. In my book, I call it rev because you get revved up when you're in that state. And the other um, branch is the parasympathetic system or the rest or digest. And in my book, I call it restore because once you get really revved up and your heart rate's going super fast, that's a, that that's a lot of tax on the system. It's very energy consuming. So you immediately want to have a restorative response that calms down the heart rate. So you can measure these two systems, the fight or flight and the rest and digest system, by looking at the heart rate. So in my lab, we look at both EEG and ECG to look at how the brain and the body are interacting during waking and during cognitive processing and also during sleep and deep sleep and REM sleep and all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, what about heart rate variability? Yeah. So heart rate variability is a is a really great measure of um, the relationship between the two different uh, branches of the autonomic nervous system. It's mostly measuring how strong your parasympathetic restore system is able to calm you down. So heart rate as um, uh, a great guy who I'm forgetting his name said, um, the heart is not a metronome. And I love that line because it really, you know, the heart has a rhythm. It doesn't beat just like a metronome. It has very big differences, millisecond, you know, orders of like tens and hundreds of millisecond differences between heartbeats sometimes, um, mostly tens. And, and the reason is, is because your heart rate will suddenly speed up if you need to like run from a tiger or you're running in a race or you suddenly have somebody approach you that you were you know, not expecting to see, your heart rate increases because you have to get ready to run. Um, and then if it turns out, oh, that's just my buddy, not some scary dude, um, you want to immediately calm yourself down. And so your heart rate is a very good um, measure of how well your restore system can suddenly quickly calm down your heart rate. So we measure the relationship between um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic sort of increase in heart rate and decrease in heart rate in variability. People who have a lot of variability in their heart rate are able to very quickly go from sitting there calmly to running down the street and having their heart racing and sending blood you know, everywhere they need to. And then the second the race is over, they can very quickly decrease their heart rate. And that person is going to have a higher variability than somebody who may have some sort of hypertension and their heart rate stuck really, really high, and they can't actually mobilize to run really fast, and they can't really calm themselves down very well. So low variability is somebody that doesn't have a very flexible heart and doesn't have sort of, you know, isn't able to adapt to situations around them very quickly. But somebody with high variability is somebody who can quickly mobilize their energy and then quickly shut shut down that system. Yeah. So heart rate variability, as I'm understanding it, is the autonomic nervous system's dynamic capability. Exactly. Would you say that's the case? Exactly. Is it a reflection of any cortical or subcortical structures? Yes. Or, or so, I mean, for sure, uh, when you look at... There's, you know, first of all, the heart rate variability is kind of like looking... I like to think about it as... Um, there's a very complex signal and it's like looking under the hood of a car that there's a lot of stuff going on. All your organs are being, are giving information from the body and then sent through one of your cranial nerves called the vagus nerve up into your brain. And that goes directly into your brainstem 
And then that information from your organs um, tells you how you're feeling, right? It's actually really good um, proprioceptive information about, you know, if you have a test to take and your gut start churning or, you know, you meet somebody you like and you suddenly have to run to the bathroom, you know, something like that's your autonomic nervous system sending information to your brain to say like, oh my God, you know, I'm excited about something or like something's really major happening. Um, so there's a really strong connection between the body and the brain through the vagus nerve. Um, and the brain also has a direct um, connection right back down through the brainstem to calm you down, right? Calm down your heart rate and calm down your guts and tell you everything's cool or, you know, or yeah, there's a lot of reason to be upset or whatever it is. It, so we have this kind of, uh, the frontal lobe in particular has a very strong connection to the vagus and to the autonomic nervous system um, because the frontal lobe is the one that's really telling you, all right, I'm assessing all the information that I'm getting from my amygdala and from my hippocampus and from my guts, and I'm deciding how should I behave? You know, what is, what is like the, what's the reasonable response right now? And then I'm gonna tune down some of those inputs to say like, well, maybe I don't need to be so freaked out, or maybe I really should be freaked out, and I'm going to amp up this signal from the amygdala and run like hell. Right. So it's interesting, this concept that you're talking about, I think, for, for people to understand it, it's um, when people say, trust your gut, right? That whole pro you're describing the physiological process of trusting your gut, right? And yeah. that's because you're getting that feeling for a reason, and then you're integrating your experiences, your memories, um, you know, your more primitive area, your amygdala, to be able to decide, you know, whether you should trust your gut or yeah. whether you shouldn't. And that's the thing, right? Sometimes you shouldn't trust your gut because your gut is not particularly thoughtful, right? Your gut is more similar to your amygdala in that it may be telling you what it's uncomfortable about, but if you have a strong kind of self-confidence and strong self-regulation, you might be able to say like, okay, I'm feeling this feeling, but I also know that this is actually okay, and so I'm gonna tune down that down. Or it may be like, no, 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 something really is wrong here, maybe I should listen to that. And so that's the frontal lobe, like a strong frontal lobe is really important to be able to decide and discern situations where you should trust your gut and when you shouldn't. Yeah, and you're describing executive function there right exactly being able to take in that stimuli and make appropriate decisions based yeah. off of that so um all right so let's talk about uh, the consequences of this imbalance between upstate and downstate can we start with um sort of the cognitive effects of too much upstate no downstate yeah so people who have uh, autonomic imbalance um, what you find is that they usually have poor self-control um, they may have poor ex executive function. It's really about do you have a strong frontal lobe? There's a really strong connection between the autonomic nervous system and um, and the frontal lobe. And so, so the you know people who actually do practice HRV biofeedback, right? They actually show that with long-term practice of HRV biofeedback, this is work done by. Um, Amara Mather at USC, she's showing that you actually can increase white matter in the frontal lobe. You can actually also increase working memory performance in the frontal lobe because you're increasing that connection and that, that um, relationship or communication between your autonomic nervous system and the frontal lobe. Um, so what you find is increased working memory, increased attention, but also an increased ability to self-regulate and um, that means emotional regulation, right? Your ability to kind of either um, tune down an emotion that isn't serving you or actually, you know, use your emotions in, in whatever flexible way you need to. So people who um, have an autonomic imbalance usually have low HRV, but they also show lower levels of working memory, lower levels of attention. Mm. And um, can you describe HRV biofeedback, like what does that actually look like? Yeah, so I mean, really what HRV is doing, um, we can actually look at the slide that talks about breathing and um, let's see, it's the one, yeah, this one. If you just go all the way through, this is a this, this slide I like because, yeah, it really shows 
how, um, how to increase your HRV. And HRV biofeedback is just using a device to help you figure out whether you're doing it correctly. But really, the way you can increase your HRV is just by engaging in slow, deep breathing. And this slide kind of explains why, which is that when we are, um, if we think about life as kind of just a bunch of different rhythms, we actually have different rhythms for every system. Um, your respiration has a particular rhythm it's breathing at, right? And usually when we're talking right now, you're breathing at like 10 to 15 breaths a minute. <clears throat> but then your heart rate also has a rhythm. It doesn't just, um, it doesn't just go, you know, sort of, you know, uh, pretty evenly um, during um, uh, across a minute, it actually has fluctuations where it, it gets a little faster, like beep, 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 and then beep, 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 beep. And you can actually see that here. These are the heart rate, and you can see that there's a bunching of the heart rate and then a slowing down and a bunching of the heart rate and slowing down. And these are the inhale, inhales and exhales of breathing. So this heart rhythm is actually significantly slower than your regular breathing rhythm. And it means that it's an inefficient system. So when you're inhaling and exhaling, that increase in heart rate isn't actually getting all the oxygen it can because by the time you're starting to exhale, you're still in your fast breathing mode. You're still in your fast heart rate mode. So, so these two systems are not synchronized and it's very inefficient. But if you engage in slow, deep breathing, which means basically a five-second inhale, five-second exhale, but you know, um, that's around about what people's slow, deep breathing paces to get into resonant breathing, it means that your heart rate, actually, the time where it's getting faster is synchronized with the time that you're on your inhale. And so the time where your lungs are filled with the most amount of oxygen means that your heart rate is also getting faster. And then when the oxygen is gone from the lungs and you start to exhale, your heart rate slows down. So it's a more efficient system that makes sure that you get more oxygen into the blood. Um, and it also is being conducted really by the parasympathetic system this that is controlling your breathing. So the greater your um, synchrony and synchrony between your your respiration rate and your heart rate, where they're both, they're up states, the inhale is happening at the same time that that um, increase in heart rate is happening, the, you have this greater HRV signal. And this greater, and, and you can really see the difference, right? This is heart rate variability when people are not breathing slowly, and there's very low parasympathetic activity in this, or there's very low consistent parasympathetic activity. But here, in this signal, you can see this very robust heart rate variability, which means that you have very strong restorative processes mm. at work. So how I'm understanding it, it's the ability for your heart rate to increase in the context of taking a deep breath and being able to oxygenate, since we're talking about the brain, you know, the brain with oxygenated blood is your heart rate variability. Exactly. Because right? if you have crappy heart rate variability, then your, then your ability to increase that heart rate in the context of you taking a deep breath isn't as good as someone with really robust, dynamic exactly. heart rate variability. Yeah, a panicky breath looks like this, right? This shallow breathing, very, very fast. Your heart rate variability is now shut down. It's in your, in your stress mode. And so your heart rate is very, very fast and you're breathing fast, but nothing is aligned, right? But when you decide, no, 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 I'm going to intentionally calm myself down. I'm, and, and, and what that's saying is, you know, at the cognitive and sort of self-regulation level, what you're saying is, when I'm breathing in a panicky fast breath and everything is so fast that I'm barely getting oxygen and I'm starting to feel panicky, I'm getting stressed out, that state is a state of being not in control, right? That's a state of being out of control. Whereas this state where you intentionally calm your breathing down, you're basically telling your body, your autonomic nervous system, I got this, right? I'm totally able to control my environment. Even if this thing that's bad is happening, I'm going to be okay, right? I can, I am controlling my breathing. So it's not just a signal that increases HRV because um, of this, 
you know, very strong synchrony between your heart rate and your respiration, but it also tells, it's also a message from the brain to say, I can self-regulate. Right. I do wonder which, uh, like the chicken or the egg phenomenon with this thing, right? Like, um, you know, the respiration, um, maybe it's a positive feedback loop, the respiration and heart rate variability, right? Like, you know, just because you slow your heart rate down, or I'm sorry, you, you slow your respiration rate down, your heart rate variability improves. Um, what about already having a really good heart rate variability? Is that going to allow you to be a little bit less susceptible to Absolutely. that sort of breathing pattern? Yeah. Or that sympathetic nervous system dump Absolutely. that you just can't control. Absolutely. Yeah. So people who, you know, if we talked about PTSD, so people who are more vulnerable to PTSD are people who don't get into this high HIV state, mm. who, who immediately have an, a panic experience during the traumatic event. Those people are more at risk for later PTSD. The people who are in a traumatic experience but can remain calm are usually people who become more resilient to PTSD. Mm. That very interesting. So let, so you're talking about PTSD. Let's talk about mood. What are some uh, consequences of this imbalance between upstate and downstate in people's mood? Yeah, I mean, an inability to regulate your mood yeah. is directly related to what we're talking about, right? This inability to sort of talk yourself through, you know, calming yourself down, calming down your heart rate, calming down your feeling, your bad feeling, putting your rational, using your frontal lobe to um, rationalize through a negative event rather than keeping it at a place of um, emotional reactivity. So people would also chronic states of that this is just we're talking about mood and of course states of depression are different than just having bad mood. Right. But there is a relationship with people with depression do have autonomic imbalance that they have uh, an, um, an, an overexpression of um, stress response and an underexpression of parasympathetic activity. Do you think HRV uh, feedback or, and biofeedback is sort of a good measure for people that suffer from anxiety, people that suffer from, you said PTSD, clearly. Um, do you think potentially that's a good sort of metric to see where you're at in terms of your mood? Yeah, there, there. I mean, not only can we do biofeedback, which is really somebody doing their own self-regulation of their HRV, but there's also vagal nerve stimulation that has been used mm. for depression right. and anxiety um, that does seem to really be beneficial. So I think it's an interesting potential treatment. Yeah. What about for like healthy people that are looking to perform better in their sport or in their, you know, in their job or anything like that? Yeah, there's lots of research that shows that, you know, team sports that do HRV or do slow, deep breathing actually do show better successes with their sports and better, you know, they show better accuracy and they show better points, you know, in terms of um, team performance. Um, there's also people, you know, who are individual sports that use HRV as a way of dealing with the stress of competition, mm -hmm. right? Because that's also something that I think beyond just being strong and accurate, there's also, you know, how much can you deal with the very deep stress of competition? Um, so there's studies that have shown that people who do HRV biofeedback training or just any kind of slow deep breathing actually are more resilient to those kind of stresses. That's interesting. I heard a, I heard a recent story, just a side note. Um, this guy, this uh, professional baseball player, his name was Tim Salmon. And it was his first time, it was like several years ago, but he was um, in the World Series. And it was his first at bat ever in the World Series. And I remember him giving an account that he went up there and his knees were shaking. I think he was the leadoff batter, which means like the first guy to go up and hit in the first game of that World Series. And it was so loud and it was just so inundating that he all he was focused on was on his knees shaking. Yeah. And of course he struck out. Yeah. But um, I wonder what his heart rate variability going Very into low. That. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for sure, you know, working on slow, deep breathing ha helps people because what they what they start to do is they use it as oh I'm feeling stressed and they get into this mode of self control. Right, I think resiliency is just such such a hot topic and be so interesting, right? Um, and I wonder, you know, working on HRV, if that would be 
you know, a, a good way to to ensure resiliency. 100 percent. You know, I, I just wonder if it's like there's a lot of genetics thrown around it. Like some people are just like genetically resilient. Right. So genetically, will they just naturally have a better heart rate variability? But these are so. lifestyle differences. Right. This is this is not something this is stuff that you can actually implement that whether there is genetic resilience doesn't matter it doesn't matter right. right everybody can work on this this is something that you know the the philosophy from the there's a there's a very important theory that i think a lot about that was developed by julian thayer and his colleagues and it's called the generalized unsafety principle of stress generalized unsafety theory of stress guts and i talk about it in my book because i think it's such a formative theory and the idea is that we come into the world stressed and that you know babies come into the world with no frontal lobe and fully revved up like all sympathetic all the time and what we learn from having parents that care for us from having or you know caretakers that care for us from having the ability to self soothe um, the ability to manage challenges such as you know learning how to read and write and how to tie our shoe and learning social interactions all of those things strengthen our sense of ourselves and they strengthen our ability to take care of ourselves and that is a direct um, uh, you know strengthens the frontal lobe basically and and that feeling of kind of being loved having community being cared for um, being able to self actualize those are things that allow us over time to develop strong frontal lobes and then when we face challenges in life we already have that system um, that allows us to handle the slings and arrows right and, and 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 reduce our stress responses when things are challenging but it also means that when people start out at very young ages without those aspects right that they are probably have more emotional reactivity right there potentially less ability to um, uh, if, if they're deprived of safety if they're deprived of uh, parents that are really taking care of them if they're violated early on or if they have scarcity um, of food or shelter um, that they may not be able to have the same benefits right and so then they already start at this state of less self-control less ability to self-regulate um, and uh, more emotional reactivity right so so it starts and it's it's a very powerful theory because it really um, it really shows how uh, it, it turns the whole stress idea on its end because people always think about stress as being out there but actually if stress is if we are stress and we're actually learning through time to control stress well then whatever we can do to really gain control at any time in our life will allow us to sort of harness this calm feeling and harness this you know higher hrv and all of these things are related to better functioning yeah it's very interesting especially with um children that are coming from um you know certain backgrounds that's just like stress all the time right you go to school you're stressed you come home you're even more stressed you know when is your actual you know downstate time period where you feel safe and secure um and then you know your hr you know you have improved hrv these people are just coming out of that scenario um so disadvantaged when you think about it from a physiologic perspective if we're thinking hrv is a pretty good reflection of resiliency yeah and so the, so the question is is like why aren't we helping people get into more calmer states right because that actually would be why aren't we promoting down states why aren't we teaching children how to calm themselves down and do breathing exercises i know i did that with my kids because i've been doing this research right, right? right. but like you know that that should be something that kids just learn is self-reliance right and, and being able to like self-soothe and and being able to take care of yourself is very critical being making sure you get right amount of sleep is the you know same level of importance as making sure you eat right yeah. and making sure you exercise yeah and then i liked what you said where it's like stress is within us right all that stuff outside i, I mean i just look at it as stimuli right it's just uh, certainly there's varying forms of that stimuli and varying intensity of it but you turn that stimuli 
into something internally. Yeah. Right. And I think that a lot of people are just like, oh, I'm just stressed out. It's like, well, why are you stressed out? What are you doing to avoid it? Exactly. Yeah. You know? And I'm certainly not speaking from somewhere where, like, you know, I don't ever get stressed out. Um, I get stressed out all the time. Yeah. But, um, you know, that that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. And I like what you said about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's powerful because it really makes you realize that it's it's in your hands and it's changeable. Yeah. You know, these are not, yeah, genetics for sure are there, but these are not things that we can't alter in our own life. Right. But it really requires, I mean, you know, the ability to actually stick with the program of doing deep breathing. I just wrote a book on this and I still don't make enough time for this stuff. Right. You know, like I'm, I'm absolutely one of my worst examples continuously yeah. of like not doing deep breathing, not getting enough exercise, sitting down all day long in front of the computer, you know, then not necessarily eating breakfast the way I keep saying everybody should be eating breakfast. Right. Like, like there's a laundry list of things that it's really hard to do. Yeah. It's certainly a great ideal to strive for though, yeah. nonetheless, you know, um, can we go back to the, the cognition aspect of it Please. just in terms of um, f your ability to focus um, your ability to problem solve. Um, the downstate is important in that aspect. And when you, if you say it is, it is the downstate itself when that cognition is best or is the downstate, like you described the wave, right? Is the downstate just very important so that when it's time to focus, right? And that upstate and you're in that upstate, you know, that's why your downstate is important. I think it's the it's the latter, right? So okay. so that so that you know, I would say focus is a realm of the upstate. Okay. Got and it. that's when you're, you know, it's very energy consuming. You're gonna you know, laser focus. You're gonna get into that mo that zone, mm -hmm. right? And really get yourself um, able to do a long period of work or really, you know, ha have your mind really clear mm -hmm. and think really directly about something or stay in a long conversation like we're having right now, right? That's what focus is. Yeah. Um, but in order to do that, if you are not resourced, like not properly resourced, mm -hmm. you're not going to have the materials and the energy and the, and the glucose, you know, that you need to sustain that level of focus or that level of energy. And the only time that we replenish those resources are in down states. Right. And you put it, you've put it, um, in a really good way, either in a talk that you gave or in the book. Um, but you said that we're basically trying to run on 10% on our phone batteries, right. right? Like, I guess you're trying to have like a two hour conversation on your phone, but your phone's only on 10%. Like what exactly. do you expect to happen? Yeah. yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not. Um, what about, you mentioned glucose. What about the metabolic consequences of constantly being in an upstate? Yeah, I mean, I think I I had to learn a lot about metabolism. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're, you're a neuroscientist. I'm, I'm a neurologist. You I know. know. When it comes like, to this kind of stuff. It but. was really, I mean, it, it was so interesting to learn. I mean, I study sleep and cognition, but to understand the upstate, downstate, and how it kind of goes through our whole system, I really wanted to look at how metabolism works because I was at the Salk Institute when Sachin Panda was, you know, showing his right. very first work. Um, where he used to call it time-restricted feeding because it was in animals, but now he moved to time-restricted eating. But all of the fasting work that was showing that, wow, when, when you eat for a shorter period of time and then you give yourself a long, long break, you actually have, you know, you're able to eat a lot during the upstate. So that's really, you're eating during the metabolic upstate. You should eat during your upstate. You should eat during your upstate, exactly. Right. The, the, our metabolism, our guts, our metabolism, our heart, each has an optimal period for energy consumption and for processing mm -hmm. food, right? right? We have the highest levels of insulin. We have the highest glucose metabolism during the day, which is why in his animal studies, he showed that he could have these animals eating like ad nauseum, literally, um, during the upstate, and then um, give them a long downstate period of fasting, and they didn't have, they looked like slim little animals. Mm. But then when he gave a different group of animals the ability to eat at any time, and they could just eat, 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 those animals they ate the same amount of calories, but they got obese, yeah. right? Yeah. Because during 
you know, when you're high in the upstate of your metabolism, you're able to process this food and use the insulin is used to turn it into energy immediately and you have energy and you use energy because it's daytime and you're out there walking around hopefully and doing stuff with yeah. it. But when you, you know, at the end of the day, everything starts to decrease, right? You've used up all your resources. You don't have an endless pool of insulin. Um, once you get to the end of the day, you're at 20% less insulin. When you start eating during that supposed, you know, that, that period where you're supposed to be in this downstate period, first of all, eating increases sympathetic arousal. It, it actually jump starts the, the, the rev, it revs your system up at a time when your sympathetic arousal should be decreasing. But you're also not resourced enough to process the food properly. Mm -hmm. And so that food, instead of being turned into energy, gets stored as fat. Mm. So people are the same as animals. When we eat at night, after, when we're in, supposed to be in our upstate of our, meta um, when we're in, supposed to be in the downstate of our metabolism, we're not able to process the food correctly and it gets stored as fat. So people show greater weight gain. Mm. So eating a shorter amount of time within a fasting window means that you're basically, um, you're optimizing your metabolism. Right. What about how does insulin resistance play into, um, into that timing? Right. So when people <clears throat> continue to eat, basically insulin resistance is a development of, um, it's a problem of just not giving your metabolism a break, mm -hmm. right? So you just continue to feed it and not just feed it all day long, which is, you know, definitely taxing on the system, but you're feeding it highly processed food that makes your insulin spike, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a lot. And basically what happens is your body stops making insulin and then you become insulin resistant and that's the beginning of type 2 diabetes. Mm. So I think it's time for us to talk about ways to enhance this down state. I think we've driven the it. <laughs> I, th I think I think we've driven the point home as to why the balance of upstate downstate is so important, right? We've talked about cognition, we've talked about mood, we've talked about the metabolic consequences of having this sort of disbalance. So let's start with we already talked about breathing, mm -hmm. right? So what about exercise? Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing about exercise that I think is is a cool way of thinking about how to use exercise to um, get yourself kind of exercising within the right time and the right type of exercise is that you can, you can use exercise to, to jumpstart your sympathetic arousal, right? So, so, and that's the rev up system. Um, and if you really use exercise to like get your heart racing, get your, um, you know, your breathing super fast, get sweaty, get your muscles exhausted, what you're doing is you're having a major stress response, right? Mm -hmm. You're having a major sympathetic arousal response. And what naturally happens after you have a really big sympathetic arousal response is a few hours later, your resources, I mean, your resources immediately comes in to try to calm your heart rate down, mm -hmm. right? Right when you're done with your sprint, your heart rate is immediately like working on trying to, your, your restore system is working on calming your heart rate down. But there's also a longer term um, restorative increase that happens hours later after a big sympathetic schwitz, mm -hmm. is that what I like to call it. Um, and so the timing of this exercise is highly um, correlated with getting into, it, with whether you can get into a good downstate. Because if you, um, exercise too late in the evening, what you're doing is you're keeping, you're going to have this very big sympathetic revved up state that's going to block your ability to get into sleep, right? right? Um, and sleep, and also it's going to block your ability to get your sympath, your, your restore system coinciding, the activation of the restore system coinciding with your slow um, with your sleep system. Mm -hmm. So actually there's a, there's a little there's a animation of that over line. here. Right. Yeah. So if this is the day, right, from daytime to nighttime on the x-axis, if you hit a, the a button. button, do the button thing. So the exercise is going to spike your rev, your sympathetic arousal, right? right? And then following that, a little while later, you're going to have this really big, go oh, one more time, Restore follows, right? And what's happening here is 
this is where your body's like, oh my God, that was so awful. I didn't have enough resources. I was exhausted. I'm now in pain. And it doesn't, it doesn't just replenish your glycogen, right? The, the sort of the, the energy is of, of the cells. It also it increases the glycogen levels right. so that by the next time you're supposed to be exercising, you have more glycogen in your muscles mm. so that you can exercise even more intensely. And that's this idea of like recovery plus, right? right. That every time you exercise, if you give yourself a really nice big restored downstate period, mm -hmm. you actually are able to ratchet up your abilities because your body keeps producing more restorative stuff during the downstate. So when you exercise in the morning, you get this really nice restore system, do one more click of the button, that coincides with your deep sleep. Mm. But if you exercise too late in the day, one more click, then what you have oh. is, and when, then is this just going to go? I yeah, there so, we yeah, Oh, small. look at that. There it is. Wow, I did not know it had that quality. <laughs> 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 what you have is, is that the, um, your exercise is now keeping your sympathetic system up too high so that you don't have the restore system comply with when you're having your slow waves. You don't get into deep sleep as well, mm -hmm. very restless sleep, and you don't have this really nice, synchronization between the restore system and the slow wave system. I mean, one I have a great example of that. One of the people I uh, interviewed for the book is this guy, Glover Teixeira, who mm. is a major MMA guy who is the oldest world champion ever. Mm -hmm. um, he was like 41 or 42 when he won the championship last year, this time last year. Um, and he has, you know, he's like downstate maven, mega, mega. Mm -hmm. And he um, is so careful about keeping himself in the downstate at all times because he says that sleep is his biggest um, problem, basically trying to get enough sleep. Because if he exercises anywhere after 1 p.m., his sleep is totally screwed, even if he stays super, super calm for the rest of the day. So he basically always starts exercise at 11 a.m., ends at 1 p.m., and, you know, in his exercise, it's, it's beyond what you could possibly imagine right. exercising. Yeah. It's like he says he drops seven pounds every time he exercises. In sweat. In in, just water weight. Yeah. In, in something. In something. So I don't know what's going on with that guy, but it's, it's scary. Yeah. Right. So, um, uh, so he's very clear about not only does he stop exercising after 1 p.m., but then for the rest of the day, he doesn't really move. Like mm. he, he doesn't he, – he's like – so he calls it his chill. He stays in a super chill mode. Right. He barely wanders around. You yeah. know, he really wants to keep. It's all about his heart rate. Yeah, keeping himself in a down state for as long as possible, so that he's recharging, recharging, recharging until the next time he's got to exercise. So, what is your recommendation on the uh, optimal time to exercise? We are not Mr. Teixeira, right? Our livelihood is not, you know, MMA. You know, so for just the general folks out there, what would you say is probably the best time to exercise? Well, it depends on the exercise. So, so um, I go into, I, I really went down into a, a wormhole <laughs> with this because uh, the, the cardiovascular exercise that really spikes up your sympathetic arousal should be in the morning mm. for sure. Okay. But our muscles, um, so, so, uh, there's a, I have a long section in the book where I talk about the difference between sort of strength-related training and cardiovascular speed type of training. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it turns out that our muscles are actually most um, in their upstate in the afternoon. So if you were going to sort of really time your exercise, you'd want to do the cardiovascular work that spikes up sympathetic arousal in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then you could do weights in the afternoon where you're actually at your strongest. So it, do weights not spike sympathetic arousal as much as? Not as much. Not as much. It's interesting. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Well, I think that it's they're slower, right? It's there's, a slower it's not. I mean, there's definitely some arousal going on for sure, sure. especially if you're dealing with like super heavy weights. But right. the weights I lift <laughs> do not spike my heart rate. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so you, you're talking about restore, right? Yeah. Um, is that just? It's probably not just, but it's an element of that. Is the parasympathetic nervous system 
but you're calling it restore and maybe that implies that there's other stuff other than just the parasympathetic nervous I system. I mean, going really, to yeah. Restore is just another word for the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay. I just think that sympathetic and parasympathetic are hard words. Old news. And I just thought, well, can we just come up with something that people will immediately be like, I get that. Yeah. Revved up, restored. Right. But there's consequences and there's results of your parasympathetic nervous system going into effect. Yes. Right. Um, very briefly, what are what are some of those things that happen in that sort of restore process that is optimal during slow wave sleep, which we're going to talk about later? But. Yeah. So it's almost like you can't separate slow waves from the, the, the deep slow wave sleep that we know is where all these good things happen during sleep and the parasympathetic um, system mm -hmm. because they usually happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. What you find is um, the greatest, so you know, part of our being in, in autonomic balance is that we have a huge amount of sympathetic arousal during the day and when the when downstate starts, you have to have a changing of the guards where this, your sympathetic, your revved up system completely lets go, mm -hmm. right, and goes into sleep mode, mm -hmm. and your restore system turns on. And you see this really big exchange of restore activity at night um, and um, uh, revved activity in the daytime. So, um, and, and specifically, the restore activity happens directly when you have these slow waves and slow wave sleep. So all of so, so in some ways it's almost like difficult to uncouple how these things are you know what's separate from them. Sure. So a lot of the time when I've looked at studies um, where I look at well what is slow wave sleep doing to cognition, and then I account for the parasympathetic activity mm -hmm. that was also happening, I actually account for way more of the change in performance. Um, when I look at the parasympathetic activity happening during slow wave sleep mm. than when I just look at the slow waves by themselves. So do you mean that when you're looking at both slow wave and the restore parasympathetic activity, if you uh, sort of rule out the effect of, paras of the parasympathetic nervous system, then will those will that not be significant? I think that we system? probably wouldn't have very much success with our deep sleep if we didn't have parasympathetic activity. And actually, I have a slide I can show you that when I look at young adults who are robust and superhero level performance, right, they have very strong slow waves and they have very strong parasympathetic activity or this restored restore response. Um, and when I bring older adults in, older than 65, I see I see choppy slow waves, not very great slow waves, lower amplitude, but I also see no mm. restorative um, parasympathetic activity. And so what I think is, you know, what, what we're showing is this is what aging looks like. You know, it, it's, it's, it's letting go of all the things that we do that keeps our parasympathetic activity bouncing, mm. right? Like really high and, sure. and activated. Um, and, and what, when we don't have that, we get fragmented sleep. We wake up a lot. We have arousals during the night that are sympathetic arousals. And all of that leads to weaker systems. Mm. So in terms of uh, performance and exercise, I am wondering, um, hypothetical situation, someone has a big performance from an athletic perspective on, you know, on a certain day. Um, based off of this and off of sort of your understanding, what should they be doing the day before? Sleeping. Sleeping? Yeah. Constant downstairs. Like, like, or just being in bed. Like, like Glover, the week where he um, won the world championship as the oldest man ever to win this kind of world championship, the whole week, I think it was in Dubai, he spent 20 hours in bed every day. <laughs> This is when he's going to go kill somebody, right? It's not like he's he's going, you think he's going to be training, he's going to be using all, he's going to be like, really? No, he's done his training. He is in deep, deep restore mode and keeping himself super calm so that he has the crashing of the wave be precise. Right. I, I don't know if you can answer this, but have you seen anything where, um, via whatever objective metric that would measure downstate the further you bring down your downstate, the higher you can get your upstate. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, I'd have to give that some thought. I don't know. I like like. I mean, it makes. I think that I think that there's a yes in me, but I haven't thought about it in that exact. Just because, if, like, from the analogy of the wave. I mean, for sure, right? it's the analogy of the wave. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that that is exactly the idea, right? That if, you know, what what happens during deep sleep, protein synthesis, right? We get the development, you know, the regeneration of glycogen. We get, uh, you know, the the um, the systems, the the replenishing of systems that have been used up. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the, the analogy in my head is that the winter, you know, if farming, we're talking farming here, let's switch over. Sure. <laughs> my dad's uh, a farmer. So. Okay, good. So, so he'll know that winter is this, the, the depth of winter is a predictor of buds in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a very strong predictor of how deep the frost is, is going to determine whether the plant is going to show a lot of buds in the spring. Got it. And so when they have higher temperatures in the winter, it's going to spoil the spring harvest be, or the summer harvest, whatever, whenever they harvest, um, because those plants haven't gotten into this deep downstate. Mm. And they haven't been able to do whatever the plants are. I mean, there's there's research on this specific idea of the depth of a downstate winter can predict the buds in the spring. So basically that's the concept of what you can see um, when you think about your own upstate and your own resources that you need to get into deep replenishing mode mm -hmm. so that when you actually need those resources, you can use them at their height. Yeah, isn't that so interesting? I'm just gonna give you another aside. Um, just like our own systems, when we look inwards and see our own systems, they really reflect a lot of these systems around us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That 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 that, that there's that it's an idea that scales. And that's weird. Like, and in your book, but we're natural animals. But in in your book, you do it. You talk about sort of the ebbs and flows, up states, down states of the neuron. Yeah. Right. And then now, and then you expand it out to our own behaviors. Yeah. Right. And then. You know, now you're talking about plants doing it. Yeah. Right. Certainly. I mean, there, yeah. I, I just now I'm, I'm remembering the specific study that will help with this idea of of of, of the depth versus the height. Mm -hmm. So there's research looking at uh, recovery of exercise, how and looking at glycogen levels. Mm -hmm. um, and what's dis what's found is that if an athlete has a major uh you know, super high impact exercise and they don't have enough of a rest period afterwards, they're glyc then they can measure glycogen and say, okay, well, then the next day they went also for a run mm -hmm. or the next day they went for an easy walk. Mm -hmm. If they're then depleted further, um, so if, if, they're, if their glycogen stores didn't have a long enough rest, they wouldn't get restored back to their regular levels and they wouldn't perform as well when they then had to um, um, uh, perform again in some sort of intense way. Yeah. But there's different types of exercise that you can do that don't necessarily tax the glycogen levels, right? So like an easy walk right. would be permissible in a down state, but not another sprint run right. because then you would be you would be further depleting as opposed to um, getting yourself ready for the next big power punch. Yeah, I guess um, that's where maybe weight training versus, you know, more aerobic activity comes in, right? If you do aerobic activity one day, maybe the next day you should be weight training and yeah. more anaerobic. And, anaerobic. And, and people are now using, like coaches are now using HRV as a response yeah, to that, is to I look at like how, you know, did you recover enough? Well, that's that's exactly this concept. Right. Did your, you know, how big is your restorative response after you exercise? Are you still in recovery mode? Well, then you shouldn't go hard. Right. And then you've also talked about sort of the ability to increase the sort of your exercise threshold by having um, an appropriate and a robust sort of restorative period. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. One? Yeah. And that's what that's what this idea is, is that, you know, you can use your heart rate as a measure of have I gotten back to 
my pre-exercise baseline? Am I ready to go further or should I still be, am I still in recovery mode? Right. So people are using, you know, that's why, you know, people are using HRV so much right now, right? Just to actually see like, well, how long of a break do I need? But after my big run, how many days of break do I need after my big run before my heart rate has gotten back to Got a it. steady state? Yeah. And if you go, you know, and, and you know the feeling, right? Where you work out after you've already worked out. It's awful. It's awful. It's terrible. Because you, you're not ready, right? Yeah. Your whole system is still in a stressed out state. It yeah. hasn't recovered. Yeah. Let's talk about diet. Okay. I came, uh, so I did a recording with Dr. Uh, Gershwin, Geshwin, sorry, about neurogenetics. And um, in my research, I came across, he does a lot of work with autism spectrum disorder. And I came across this study that he did. And Dr. Geshwin, please correct me if I'm wrong. You can send me a, a mean email or something like that. But my understanding was that they transferred the microbiome of autistic human patients into healthy mice. And that transfer of the microbiome repli wild. replicated the autistic behaviors in that mouse model. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Like it's zoonotic it's, crazy. I know. It's crazy. It's <laughs> like, okay, like what is going on yeah. with our diet with this microbiome? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you can actually jet lag an animal screw up their microbiome and then put that microbiome in a non-jet lagged animal and sh have them show and they'll be, and they'll be jet, jet lagged. Jet <laughs> <laughs> and then you can actually improve an animal's jet lag syndrome by having a healthy microbiome, microbiome. put into the jet lagged animal. That's crazy. Yeah, the microbiome is only beginning to be understood. It's insane. It's like having a condo living inside you of completely different animals. It's like a separate nervous system, mm -hmm. almost. Yeah, they're separate species from us. Yeah. But let's talk about diet. I mean, my, my point of that was like to talk about the importance of diet because diet certainly affects microbiome. Right. Right. Um, and especially in the context of upstate, downstate, yeah. you know, our diet is really important. And I think, you, you know, maybe on the pod or before our recording, you mentioned the importance of timing the diet. Yes. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. We've so, got the slide, too, if you want me to pull it up. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Here we go. So this is the conversation we were having about how, how our metabolism has an upstate and a downstate. And during the upstate is when we're in our, you know, the, the daytime is when we're upstate of our metabolism, and then it starts to decrease, and then we have this downstate. So, you know, the it's not just the when of when we're eating, but it's also the what of yeah. when we're eating, right? Because yeah. if you are spiking your blood sugar levels, you know, outside of this period of of the upstate, you're basically driving yourself to be in this high upstate state when you should be in a downstate. So right. we talked about that. Yeah. But then there's also foods that contribute to that, right? So foods that are high in fiber are the ones that actually are extremely good for the microbiome and extremely good. It turns out that people who are, you know, up in the 100-year-old age range, mm -hmm. those are the ones who are eating high quantities of fiber. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, all of the, um, the type of foods that you find in uh, Mediterranean diet, Japanese diet, the mind diet, all these foods that basically have low sugar, um, low, no processed foods whatsoever, mm. um, who are um, high in omega-3s, less so in omega-6s, uh, actually eating omega, yeah, yeah, omega pills mm. actually is very beneficial because it's hard to get that as much food as you need, um, as much as you Omega um, from the food that you omega eat. Omega from yeah. the um, food that you eat. So just adding that as a sub supplement, I think, you know, even though we're not supposed to really be eating that many supplements, I do think that there's enough evidence that the omegas actually are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but, but keeping yourself in a food range that's just natural food, yeah. right, instead of all the processed foods that we eat all the time. Yeah, but what does that processed food do in terms of your insulin, glucose metabolism, even inside this sort of gap, 
that you want to be eating at? Like, is it just a matter of, I mean, so, it certainly does a yeah, lot. Yeah, what but. it's doing is it, you know, so it's not necessarily as bad to eat it when your metabolism is high, but it does overextend your upstate, right? Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, it's never good to eat that stuff, but when your metabolism is high, you can kind of handle it. But if you have too much of it, then you get into that insulin resistance thing, right? Where you're overtaxing your metabolic system by spiking the insulin every time you have like super high processed foods that just immediately gets turned into sugar or super high processed or super fat foods or super, um, um, you know, the oxidative stress that you mm. create when you're eating too many processed foods. So these processed foods just require that much more insulin or whatever metabolic capability to just digest. Yeah. yeah. And so I think about it as, um, you know, a factory mm -hmm. and the factory has like a steady state where that, where if, if you have, you know, one of these factories that has a line of products that are going through the line and every step, there's a certain thing that has to happen to it. And I don't know if you, I mean, there's some old, really funny TV shows or cartoons that sort of show suddenly when the system starts to speed up and it's going outside its optimal right, speed and, yeah. and everything just starts yeah. to go crazy. Mm -hmm. And it starts, you know, basically you're creating a system that is going way too fast and is producing way too much little, these free radicals, yeah. right? And you're um, spiking your, your, your sympathetic arousal way too much. And this sets you up for states of oxidative stress right yeah have you seen the um the video of that big mac that where they just like set it out you know i don't know where but and they just left it there for years and it looks exactly the same oh my god as it did on day one i mean can you imagine your body having to digest that thing? yeah exactly i mean it's delicious but yeah it would take a lot of insulin probably. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's the thing. It's like, not necessarily meat is bad, but like that type of meat that. is bad. And too much of that is bad. Yeah. Right? If you eat that s five days a week, that's not good. Yeah. If you eat that maybe once a week, okay. Like, yeah. we don't have to be super, super severe and never eat these bad foods. But I think the thing is, you, you know, the more you do it, the more you're putting strain on your system. Right. Now... Is there any way to correlate this with the past graph that we did with exercise? So it seems like it's it's very similar in terms of when you should be exercising and like when you should be eating, right? You should yeah. exercise in the morning, eat in the morning. Yeah. And then it kind of has that same shape. That yeah, I, I mean, it is. It's that, that's exactly right. If you, if these systems are, you know, the sun gives us a very strong upstate. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that blue light, from early morning light mm -hmm. stimulates the entire upstate of all of our systems. Right. And so th there's no surprise there that your metabolic upstate is going to be the same as your extra, you know, your cardiovascular upstate mm -hmm. is going to be the same as your cognitive upstate. Right. You know, we are better thinkers during those hours compared to how we think in the middle of the night. There's this whole area now looking at, um, thinking at night and sort of bad behaviors that we do at night and how bad are, you know, our frontal lobes by the end of the day are so pooped out that basically when we're supposed to be making these decisions to like turn off the TV, stop eating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That executive at the front is passed out, right? right? right. And so that's when we have the hardest time resisting sure. and being self-regulated. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Let's talk about substances. Okay. Caffeine. Yeah. Do we have a graph for that? Is it allowed? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, caffeine is in the system about four to six hours. Yeah. So having it any time after noon is probably not a smart idea. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's, I've, I've done, when I was first doing research, I was doing all my research on napping. And we did a study where I, I did a head-to-head -head comparison of a dose of caffeine in the afternoon versus a nap. And I actually showed across three different memory tests, the nap benefited. Mm -hmm. Um and even uh, we had a placebo condition and a, and a caffeine condition. And what we found is actually that caffeine decreased performance. Um, but if you got the placebo and you sort of thought maybe you were getting caffeine, mm -hmm. you showed really good performance. You actually showed increases in performance. So if you could constantly be kind of teasing yourself that you're getting caffeine but not take caffeine, you might actually have better effects than if you took the caffeine. Right. So, I mean, but again, it follows the same rule, right, which it's like, 
you should be drinking caffeine probably first thing in the morning. Along yes, with we have to, rhythms to, exactly to stimulate that sort of upstate. Yes, exactly. I mean, you know, the fact is that we are addicted to caffeine, and and in the logic of drinking caffeine in the morning is not because we need to wake up. We've just had a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. It's because we're in withdrawal mm -hmm. and we need to satisfy our caffeine addiction, yeah. which is why we drink it in the morning, right. right? So, in fact, we don't really need caffeine. I mean, I drink caffeine every morning. I have a cup of tea every morning. That's not caffeine. <laughs> not, to, not to a real hardcore caffeine fiend like me. Okay, <laughs> fine. It's a, like a big thing of like black tea. Yeah, but that's true. That's true. <laughs> but what about um, the timing of when you drink your coffee in the morning? So listen, um, I follow Andrew Huberman. I'm a big fan. Shout out Andrew Huberman. Um, his recommendation is to delay the caffeine a little bit in the morning. I think it was like 90 minutes. Do you have any insight on that or I don't know what he says about that, but it's probably because, you know, we are in a state of addiction. Mm. And so letting your own system wake you up. We have what's called a cortisol awakening response, mm. which means that right before you're supposed to wake up and during the first hour or so of being awake, you actually have this spike in cortisol, which is your stress hormone, that's supposed to get you out of bed and get you going and mm -hmm. get your heart moving and you know not give you a heart attack, right? It'll actually get you ready for the day. Mm. And what we do is we kind of over, um, we override that by drinking caffeine. We have a natural waking up system. So my guess is what he's saying is like, you can have the caffeine, but that's not what you should be waking up with. Does, it, does caffeine suppress that cortisol response? Do you know? Um, I don't know if it suppresses that cortisol response, but it, but it is definitely, you know, we are... Um, we are habit, because we are rhythmic, mm -hmm. we are habit formation animals, right? And so no matter what, it's creating a habit of that need. Right. So it's creating a need at a very specific hour. Right. So if you can kind of delay that for as long as possible, you may, it, you know, who knows what it's doing? I don't actually know what caffeine, that's a really good question, what caffeine is doing with cortisol awakening response. There's probably data about that. Yeah, there's probably data about that. We'll get back to you guys on that. Um, You've talked about Adderall and a lot of stimulants before in the past. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, it's I, I kind of have an anti-biohacking approach. Is you know, that, is that regarded as biohacking? I think Adderall? that people who are taking pills to override their natural systems. It's one form of biohacking. Mm -hmm. I think that the the idea that you know that you can that you can sort of somehow trick the system, trick nature to regenerating and do all this kind of magical stuff as as sort of a trick. I think that's what the idea of biohacking is. And so I, I feel like, well, what about if you just did the things you're supposed to do and saw how that worked first, mm -hmm. and then maybe not. Maybe maybe you wouldn't need to do all these other things, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, an extreme version of that is obviously drinking, you know, having Adderall during the day when you don't have ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. It's the idea of like, well, if I need to be awake, I'll just take this pill, mm -hmm. right? Um, and You've called it jacking up the upstate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right? So we did research on non-medical use of stimulants during the day. And we looked at its effect on sleep, and we looked at its effect on daytime performance, and then overnight memory gains. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found is that it actually doesn't really impact it in, in the way that people think it is. These are well-rested adults. They're taking Adderall in the morning at 9 a.m. We give them a bunch of frontal lobe you know, executive function tests during the day. We really didn't see a lot of improvement, like, like, like we really didn't see a lot of improvement at all um, in terms of the executive function when they're on the drug versus placebo during the day. What we did see is you lost an hour of slow wave sleep mm -hmm. at night. And then what we also saw is that the people who had the drug who didn't have the slow wave sleep, as much slow wave sleep, they also didn't show those memory benefits that the placebo condition did Got that it. we always show, right? Got it. So, and this is people getting the drug at 9 a.m. A lot of people don't, a lot of people who take the drugs, they don't even think about 
when they're taking the drugs. They just take it, right? So even with that long day, it's still depleting your nighttime sleep. Right. Now, I wonder, these were people that were taking Adderall, right, all the time. What no, about these are people naive? who had they had them. No? They had had some experience with Adderall, but they weren't they weren't regular takers. They 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 weren't naive, but they weren't, you know, abusers. Mm. And we've talked about the importance of slow wave sleep, particularly to that restore function. So, I mean, it might be getting in the way of that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot of kids on Adderall. Well, there's kids on Adderall, but then there's a lot of kids who don't have ADHD who are now on Adderall, and there's a lot of adults on Adderall. These are, I mean, this is, this right, but, is this. But you're not discriminating, you're not discriminating amongst those groups though, right? Like, if Well, you, in this if study, these ADHD, are people who don't have ADHD, but for sure, the people who have ADHD have the same problems with sleep. Right. It's, they're losing slow wave sleep, yes. regardless of whether you have ADHD or yes. not, right? It's but it's also, you know, oh, yeah. like, I mean, yeah, my thought is like, maybe we're just, if we could decrease the dosage, make sure that the dosage is occurred as early as possible in that's, the morning. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, how do we know? What is the smallest amount? I feel like people don't always go for the smallest dosage. Right. They go for the standard dosage. The one that works the best, which is yeah. obviously going to be the higher one. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what about uh, some other substances that aren't as legal as Adderall? Um, like cannabis, for example, marijuana. What have you been finding in terms of sleep? So interestingly, cannabis, um, even though it has the reputation of being, you know, a stoner, drug mm -hmm. right it actually spikes your sympathetic arousal and right. it's, it's associated with cardiovascular um heart attacks mm -hmm. and and i was really surprised to learn that because i thought you know mellow no not mellow it doesn't help with sleep and it it definitely does not help with your restorative response mm. yeah that's interesting what does it do to slow wave sleep? It decreases. It it doesn't necessarily always in every study show decreases. Sometimes it does show decreases, but it definitely does not increase it. Mm. And alcohol? Alcohol is an interesting one because I think people start a lot of people use alcohol to get to sleep mm -hmm. um, because it actually and cannabis does, and marijuana. Yeah, but that's, that's one of, yeah, one but of the main who reasons. knows why? Yeah. But alcohol actually does increase sleep onset. Right. But the problem with it is that it also the second that alcohol gets sort of absorbed, you then wake up um, and people have, and it decreases your REM sleep. So usually mm -hmm. what happens is when you drink alcohol, you can get to sleep faster, but then you wake up in the middle of the night and you're completely awake and then you get no REM sleep. Yeah. I think I've been seeing there's significant effects on heart rate variability oh, yeah. for chronic alcohol uh, use. I'm not surprised about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about the vagus nerve because mm -hmm. you mentioned it before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's part of our autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it to you in this sort of downstate, upstate regulation? So the vagus nerve balance? is really the main artery of influence between the body and the mind. Um, it's so just to make sure that people understand, it's not an actual artery. No, right? The it's a cranial nerve. nerve. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> but it's I'm really sorry. a major. Um, it's 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 the major conduit and, and 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 tapping into it either by you know self-regulated breathing but you can also do vagal nerve stimulation now mm. and there are systems that are either attached to your ear where you could do vagal nerve stimulation and shows all sorts of restorative benefits um uh or you can actually have them in attached inside these uh, internal um, vagal nerve stimulators yeah. that are also shown a whole bunch of medical benefits psychological benefits um so i think that there's a a big future in you know the stimulation world in yeah. terms of vagus nerve yeah i i've seen there's a fda approved vagal nerve stimulator for migraines mm -hmm. you know who knows what's going on with migraines in this context but mm -hmm. um it's very interesting how you might be able to apply that to induce a down state or yeah. to enhance one? Yeah, I mean, I had one that I got from Germany that was an auricular vagal nerve stimulator um, in the ear. And the second that you, the second I put it on, it just, you felt calm. Mm -hmm. Like it really, and I, my sister who has anxiety, when she put it on, you could literally physically see her wow. calm down. And she was really into it. You mm -hmm. know, you could see why. It's a um, 
it's a positive influence yeah. on, a, on a stressed out state. Yeah. And then certainly your breathing pattern affects the vagus nerve. It can stimulate it too, depending on your pattern. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's, yeah, there's ways in which you can naturally stimulate it. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so what are your thoughts on the sort of whoop Apple tracking of heart rate variability? Do mm -hmm. you think that might be useful? For people? I think it's useful in general. I think the problem with a lot of these devices is that they're not always perfectly accurate. And what happens is they start to develop an expectation in the person that this is how they feel, mm -hmm. right? That they people start to say, well, this is what my this is what my device told me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's potentially accurate, and sometimes it's not, right? right. And so you can actually um, override your own sense of yourself and your own proprioceptive sense of like, did I sleep well? Right. How is my heart rate doing? Like, you know, how deep is my restore right now um, by this system that is faulty? Um, and so people, I, you know, I, I keep hearing people like getting upset because they are not getting good readings. Mm -hmm. And it may be that that's the case that you have poor HRV and that you're not getting slow wave sleep at night. It may be the case that the ring didn't pick up with your heartbeats. Yeah. And that happens quite a lot. Like I'm using the Aura ring in my research and I find there's a lot of dropout, like a lot of dropout, mm. right? And so what are we basing these assessments on? Um, it's not in lab ECG. It's it's something that's trying to get a, a very small, you know, signal from through a lot of different material in your body and not always ha with success right mm -hmm. so um so my feeling about those is that they're great and first of all i'm super happy about all these devices because it means that people are beginning to pay attention Be to this mindful stuff about right it. and yeah. it's it's so it's a great i mean it's it's wonderful yeah. and it's making people think about sleep in a way that no one's people haven't done before so that's great um but i i want i i, I want for people to have um, it as a reference point, but not as a predictive point, right? right? Like that if you wake up, check in on yourself. How, how do I think I slept? You right. know, like, did I, did I, do I feel well rested? Do I need like a big cup of caffeine? Or maybe I actually slept well enough that I don't need it today. Mm -hmm. And then look at the device and see what it said. Sometimes it's going to be right on and super accurate. Sometimes it's not. And then you can say like, okay, well, that wasn't accurate. Pay more attention to how you feel right. because in study after study, the subjective feelings are more accurate in terms of predicting behavior than those devices. Got it. Great. So we're talking about all sorts of different down states and we're, um, we're talking about, you know, there's upstates, downstates throughout your day. But I think that the most significant downstate in your day is sleep. Yeah. Right. And it, it sounds like a lot of what we work towards during our day is to sort of optimize the most important down state of our day, right? Which is, like I said, sleep. Yeah. In, 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 our, in our best world, we are working all day long to get good sleep. Right. So let's talk about sleep. <laughs> but a lot of people are not <laughs> working all day long right. to get good sleep. Right. Yeah. It's just uh, a lot of people have a lot going on and then yeah. you're just like, okay, I'm tired now, so I'll go to sleep. Yeah, and yeah. by that time you're super stressed out and you've been, you know, dousing yourself with like horrible things on the internet. Right. And then you're like, okay, sleep happened. Right. And it doesn't. And it doesn't for happen. Many you people. get frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the different sleep stages just to set a foundation. Sure. And I think it's important to do that because we really want to identify when slow wave sleep happens. Sure. Right. So, so there's so a important. figure, um, there is a, an image we could use. Oh, is, it, is that a Big Mac? It's a Big Mac. It's a Big Mac. I know. How did yeah. we miss that? Okay, so this keep is going. your Recovery Plus plan. We're gonna we're gonna loop back to this after well, we go through sleep. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, here we go. So you can just open that whole thing up. So this is a single sleep cycle. It's about a ninety minutes, and through the sleep cycle, you're gonna go through all the major stages of sleep. Mm -hmm. There's stage one sleep, which is just the first couple of minutes of falling asleep, mm -hmm. and then you get into stage two sleep. Um, so the ninety minute sleep cycle can 
in some ways be broken up into 30 minute segments where you have sort of 30 minutes, say, of stage two sleep, mm -hmm. which is, um, it's actually about 60% of your sleep is stage two sleep. Mm -hmm. And there's some real key elements of sleep, stage two sleep, which is really important for memory and intelligence and cognition, all sorts of things. Um, one is the sleep spindle. Mm -hmm. That's how you know you're in st stage two sleep because right. there's tons of sleep spindles. Right. Then you go into deeper stages of sleep that's called slow wave sleep. And we've talked about it before, but it's really the part where you have the brain is in the most different period than waking. Right. Um, your brain is in a very slow uh, uh, neural communication state. You have these things called slow waves. Um, and you can see those there. And basically what we've shown in our lab is that during the, up, this is actually where the downstate got its name, mm -hmm. is there's upstates and downstates to the waves, and the upstates when it's high, and then there's a downstate, upstate, downstate, upstate, downstate. Mm -hmm. During the upstate, these slow waves are actually coordinating all the neural communication that's happening um, in terms of in the upstate, all the neurons start talking to each other, mm -hmm. and then in the downstate, all the neurons are silent. Got it. So you have these really big waves of excitation and then inhibition, right. excitation and inhibition across the slow wave sleep. And this is when all of these deeply restorative things are happening during slow wave sleep. Then once you have a big bolus of slow wave sleep, then you pass through stage two again and you get into rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. And that's when you have all your crazy dreams. Um, and there's there are dreams that occur in other sleep stages, but they're not that kind of crazy fanciful dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have total body paralysis. That's a real strong signature of, of REM sleep and also the rapid eye movements, which is a signature of REM sleep as well. Mm. So this is sort of one sleep cycle, but if you go to the next figure, so now if we look at this in terms of the color coding of, um, of the dark blue is slow wave sleep and the red is REM sleep and the light blue is stage two sleep, and this is an entire night of sleep. Mm -hmm. So, and each black line is a is the end of a sleep cycle. Right. And what you can see actually is that you have a lot of slow wave sleep in the first part of the night. Mm -hmm. And as you finish off, and the and the reason for that is that slow wave sleep is where all that restorative replenishing stuff happens, mm -hmm. right? So you've had a whole long day. Of, re of, of spending all your resources, of, ex you know, of draining your resources. And so what you need immediately is to get into a state of slow wave sleep. Makes sense. Because it does, you know, it's the growth hormone increases, it decreases the cortisol, like all these good things happen, protein synthesis happens at the end of the day. It's really, this is the down state. Mm -hmm. um, once you've satisfied your need and you've recovered from all that waking by having all this slow wave sleep, you start to see more and more REM. Right. And actually, REM sleep, really critically, REM sleep doesn't have that kind of homeostat. Like, you know, it's all, slow wave sleep is a homeostatic um, system because depending on how long you've been awake will determine how much slow wave sleep you need. Okay. REM sleep isn't like that. It's actually based on a circadian rhythm. So you start to have REM sleep at the same time of night every night, no matter how, no matter what time you went to sleep. Mm. So if you, if you click uh, two, two times, so the early part of the night is all your slow wave sleep. The end morning time is all your REM sleep. Um, and so the time that you get to bed is actually really important because no matter what, your REM sleep is going to start when it starts. Mm. So if you get to bed at 2 a.m., you only have a certain amount of time to get some slow wave sleep in there before REM sleep takes over. If you get to bed at 10 a.m., you have a lot more chances of getting enough slow wave sleep to happen before your REM sleep starts. I, I think you meant 10 p.m., but that's an awesome. PM. Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome point. That's excellent. Yeah, that's why one of the big recommendations in my book is to get to bed early. Earlier because yeah. it gives you the opportunity for all of the slow wave sleep. Get, yeah, so if you need more time out of your day, get to bed earlier and get up earlier, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't really need, we don't really understand REM sleep, but we don't actually need as much um, 
uh, as we need slow-late sleep, I would say. I mean, REM sleep is very important, right. but we can do without, we can do on less REM sleep than we can do on less slow-late sleep. When are you consolidating all those memories and everything that you learn throughout your day? Is that primarily no, happening? It's a, it's a full experience. It's a full nighttime experience. Yeah. Um, there's a whole process that goes on during slow wave sleep. Um, and that process is, is usually considered to be um, kind of the data saving process mm -hmm. where you're holding on to the actual experiences that you had, right? And that's very important. You don't want to lose the memories for what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And that goes on by this reactivation of these memories over and over again in these loops that require you know, the hippocampus to speak to the, to the cortex mm -hmm. where you have all these memories um, uh, lodged in, these, in, in the cortical areas. And so through this reactivation of these memories during non-REM sleep, slow wake sleep in particular, um, and stage two, you cement those memories as good as you can into your long-term memory. But then you need to also create associations between those memories and everything else that's in your brain, right? right? And so that is what is thought to happen during REM sleep. Yeah. Um, where you can start to integrate things and start to find connections between things, which is why REM sleep is also associated with higher creativity. Because it's that kind of free associative brain that is able to allow your new experiences to then be randomly kind of associating with all the other things you know about the world and your life. Yeah. So is that why, is that why right after people wake up, you know, there's like stories of, forget who it was, but I think the song was Yesterday. That he woke yeah. up and he knew, he like knew the There's tune or something like of, that. Of examples, and it's right like, after you wake up, which it's like when you know your REM sleep is like optimal, exactly. right? Yeah, there's a lot of examples of great discoveries happening from people waking up. Right. And we did a study where we actually said, well, if that's true, then we should be able to give people a creativity task and have naps that have only non-REM sleep, and then compare those to naps that have non-REM plus REM, mm -hmm. and the naps that had REM sleep should be the ones that showed greater creativity, and that's exactly what we found. We found a 40% increase in creativity in the naps that had REM sleep compared to the naps that didn't. Wow. So if you're trying to enhance your creativity, sleep, make sure you're getting your morning, morning sleep. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, so a lot of the adverse effects of, you know, that upstate, downstate imbalance is, you know, it's probably very similar to the consequences of not getting enough sleep, right? We talked about the metabolic, the mood, everything like that. I wanted to make sure that we hit the effect of not getting enough sleep on uh, your risk of dementia, on possibly yeah. getting dementia. So yeah. you've mentioned something, and I think it's a relatively new discovery and, you know, relative to, you know, a lot of the other things that we know in the brain the glymphatic system. Right. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah. So it was discovered by uh, a woman, it was a Danish neuroscientist, and I point that out because I'm Danish, and so she's my... Nice. You know, from the mother country. Mm -hmm. And um, so what she figured out was that the brain is actually, during deep sleep, flushing toxins that can get built up um, through neural interactions, right? Mm -hmm. That you have these kind of little proteins that get left in the brain through neural interactions. Um, and what happens during slow wave sleep is that the brain through this CSF just basically goes through waves of flushing those systems out, mm -hmm. right? Those what are called toxins out of the brain. Um, and this is critical because for people who have um, dementia and Alzheimer's, those proteins get left in the brain and then they turn into those plaques and tangles that are associated with those disorders. Yeah. Um, and what's now been examined is, and this is the part that really people hate to hear, is that the sleep that people are getting in their 40s and 50s can, can actually predict the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's in their 70s. Because... If because this is a very slow, gradual process, right. and so if you're somebody who has sleep problems and is not getting good deep, slow wave sleep, you're having a gradual, you know, not flushing of the system, mm -hmm. um, which will then, you know, potentially contribute to the onset of these diseases. Um, 
But I mean, the good news is, is that the second you start sleeping well is better, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it's just that, you know, how do you increase slow waves? How do you increase, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to show was in, in when we look at um, the difference between uh, the, the restorative activity in young adults and older adults. And if you can go to that slide, because it's a really strong example. Yeah, so here we are. Yeah, yeah. So in this, you can just go all the way through. Yeah. Um, so in this slide, this is data that we collected in the lab where we looked at the um, the parasympathetic activity during uh, deep sleep, you know, slow wave sleep, stage two sleep, and waking. And what you can see in young adults is that you see this really big restore activity during slow wave sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've correlated with is is that that um, combination of high slow wave sleep and high parasympathetic restore activity with all of these brain cleaning, you know, perception, memory, creativity, working memory, executive function, these are all related to having this combination of high restore activity during slow waves. If you look at the older adults in the lab, when they came in, this is older than 65, they don't show any increases in their restore activity during slow wave sleep. And their slow wave sleep is almost unrecognizable in mm. terms of being slow wave sleep. Like we have these really big amplitude slow waves and really big restore activity during when we're younger. And then as we get older, you just see these the amplitude of the slow waves become much, much smaller and virtually no restore activity during slow wave sleep in older adults. And so you know what I think is going on is this is this is a, this is a signature of aging, right? Is is that you're losing these vital functions of restore or downstate functions as you get older by but it but as I said, it's happening in our 40s and 50s. It's not just something that happens, you know, in our 70s. Right. It it's, starts much earlier. It starts much earlier, and I think that um, myself included, how we felt about this is sort of like a, it's a natural history. Right. It's like you just develop sleep problems as you age. Your autonomic nervous system just degenerates like your brain does as you age. It's just natural history. It's just going to happen. But you're saying, you know, if you're a little bit more active and, or rather proactive in your 40s and 50s, potentially you can be part of that, you know, lighter blue group than this darker blue group. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing about, you know, I think that sleep science is always focused on the night and what we're doing in our bedroom. But what the whole conversation we've been having has been about yeah. the daytime. And, and, the, and the contribution of this book to this argument is saying it's not, you know, sleep doesn't just happen when you try to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. It starts the second you wake up. Mm -hmm. you're, you're actually setting yourself up to get good slow waves and get good restore activity at night. But if you keep yourself in a high stress state and you don't, take a break, you know, mm -hmm. calm yourself down, do some deep breathing, go into nature, you know, get close to a tree every now and again, right. like get out of the traffic and just, you know, be, be with friends, you know, have like intimate relationships where you feel that kind of protected, nice, safe feeling. Mm -hmm. All these things help us during the day to get to the point where at night we're not these super stressed right. out, tense people. Right. We're actually relaxed, and we can set ourselves up to get into a deep sleep. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You mentioned perception up there. What do you did you find that this sort of sleep with this restorative activity upon awakening the next day, your perception is improved? Yeah. So this is looking at um, actually, I, I have this. I have a slide for this. Do you want to look In at here? it? In here. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Let me see. The, it's the nap study. The nap study. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get to naps. Okay, let's go to naps. Okay, so here I can just I can just talk. You, so so, this is daytime. This is at the top is nighttime where okay. we already went through where we have a lot of slow sleep in the first part of the night mm -hmm. and a lot of REM in the second part of the night. So I started doing research in naps in graduate school because the the person I was working with Bob Stickold, who's kind of like the godfather of like putting together <clears throat> our modern way of looking at sleep and memory, and he mm -hmm. really was the one who him and Jan Born in Germany, they really um, created the methodology that we all use right now. So he was my mentor, um, along with me and Matt Walker were in the same lab. And 
when um, what's interesting about his research is he was always looking at a full night of sleep and showed that you need to have six to eight hours of nighttime sleep to show any performance improvements. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, it's because you need to have a lot of slow wave sleep mm -hmm. in the first part of the night, and then you need to wait the whole night to get a bunch of REM sleep, right? right? But in naps, what's interesting is you have what I call a shadow cycle, is that basically that circadian rhythm continues. You know, you have very low sleep pressure, which is your need for slow wave sleep. So in the morning, you've got very low um, uh, amounts of slow wave sleep in the nap, but you have this circadian pressure to have high REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So your naps in the morning have a lot of REM sleep. Your naps in the evening, because of this buildup of your need for slow wave sleep, you have a lot of slow wave mm -hmm. sleep in your evening naps. And then if you do one more click, there's a, there's a midpoint in the day where your naps have equal amounts of slow wave sleep and REM. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to look at those periods where you can actually have sort of a mini night in the middle of um, the day. And this is also the period where siesta cultures usually take naps, mm -hmm. right? This one to three is, is this natural time where right. people have decreased core body temperature, decreased functioning, they're tired. Maybe this is some sort of a natural state it is us napping. Mm -hmm. So let me see. If, I think it's the next slide. Um, so what I first... Um, looked at was, this is with, without the animation, is a little bit hard to understand, but basically what I found was that when I gave people a perceptual task, we're coming on to perception now, mm -hmm. um, I gave people a perceptual task and I tested them several times across a day. What I found is what happened in the blue line is that performance just deteriorates. Right. We're not able to maintain our optimal levels of performance across a day. If I gave somebody a nap that was about a 60-minute nap, their performance would get back to baseline and stay at baseline, which means that they didn't show that deterioration that the no-nappers um, showed, but they didn't actually, which is great, right? But they didn't actually improve beyond baseline. They didn't show any learning. Right. So I thought of putting in the um, longer naps that included REM sleep. Mm -hmm. So then I added a 90-minute nap. Can you put one more click? So in this case, I'm, I, I have that same perceptual task where it's basically just people have to use their peripheral vision to, um, to uh, determine whether oriented lines are you know, vertically oriented or horizontally oriented. It's a very simple, simple task, but it goes very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at sort of peripheral visual processing right. speed. Um, and so I gave it now just twice at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. And then I looked at the difference score between those to see if did they get worse or did they get better. Right. Um, and just click through. So the no nap condition still showed this deterioration that their performance got worse. So we're still, even if it's only two sessions and there's a whole day of recovery, your brain is still not able to recover from this training. Um, but if you give people a nap of 90 minutes, we actually showed performance that was beyond baseline and we showed increases in performance. And that's including, that 90 minutes includes the REM. Exactly. So that's one with REM and slow wave sleep and stage two sleep. Mm -hmm. And then we wanted to compare the magnitude of benefit on that perceptual task to a, from a nap to that of a full night of sleep. So we had another group of people just test at night, have a full night of sleep and come back in the morning. And then you can click one more time. And what we found is that the nap um, was equal to a night of sleep in terms of of, in terms of performance, performance yeah. and it was what's interesting is is when we looked at how that people were sleeping, we showed that people actually the slow wave sleep and the REM sleep were vitally important. That you needed to have both. Did you compare the time of naps? Like um, this nap is I think noon, right? And then you extended it to ninety minutes to include REM in addition to slow wave sleep. Did you ever look at like a morning nap? I didn't do that in this nap? study, but I did do it in another study. And it, it is it, it really does work that the naps that have slow wave sleep, um, th sorry, the naps that occur in the morning really have almost no slow wave sleep. Yeah. Um, but uh, they do have a lot of REM sleep, yeah. So this, uh, you did this in 2003. Why have I been seeing a lot of like, don't take a nap, you know, in your day, um, save it up for the, your nighttime? It's just a long history of... Uh, 
sleep clinicians mm. not believing in naps. Um, and I think that it comes from insomnia. One of, one of the most uh, effective ways of getting people to sleep better who have insomnia is to not let them get any sleep at all, mm -hmm. not during the day at all, and shorten their period of sleep so that they have these only like four or five hours in bed. Mm -hmm. um, and so they get to sleep really late at night and they have to wake up really early and basically like force them to associate actually exhaustion and sleep with their bed. Mm. So that's a very um, oft used treatment for insomnia. And it created the um, mentality around naps in the sleep field that naps are terrible for nighttime sleep. Mm. But I'll say that all of my research um, su research subjects always have good nighttime sleep. Okay. So these nap studies, um, these nap results are always on top of um, good sleep. Uh, good nighttime yeah. sleep. So it's not. It's they're never replacement naps. Got it. Yeah. What about um, what have you been? Have you found anything regarding uh, motor skill learning? And yeah, how we that did the same sleep? research and a whole bunch of other people. And so this was like one of the first nap studies of this kind, and then now it became people use naps now all the time because it's a way easier way to do sleep research than having people sleep all night and yeah. just, and you have way better controls mm -hmm. right because you can really time the nap and figure out i want to nap with rem sleep or without rem sleep or with slow wave sleep or without slow wave. so people really use naps a lot now um and so they've looked at motor learning and showed nap the same benefits from a nap as a nighttime of sleep and motor learning creativity attention working memory like all sorts of things and all those things are same thing 90 minutes, noon to three, where you have both slow wave and REM sleep to get like a balanced slow wave Not necessarily. There's a lot of different types of studies. So okay. some people are looking at, um, they only think that non-REM is important. So they may not add, they may have just like a 60 minute nap or a 45 minute nap because they just want to have a little bit of slow wave sleep and not so much, and they don't care about REM sleep. So every study has its own kind of flavor. Got it. But what, what is your thought on motor learning? Is that more of like, do you want more REM? Do you want more slow wave? Well, the early studies on motor learning were showing that it's actually stage two sleep mm. and the sleep spindles that mm. were good for motor learning. And it turns out that um, that, I mean, that's probably still true in terms of some element of it, but I think it's probably pretty nuanced because motor learning has the quality of actually showing, you know, you get motor fatigue. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's learning also, mm -hmm. and it's kind of more similar to the perception, right? Is that you can have perceptual fatigue, but learning on top of that as well. So, so I think that, um, we don't really understand what is sleep doing in terms of, um, increasing accuracy versus just, uh, decreasing fatigue. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Can we talk about other methods of optimizing sleep? Sure. Temperature. Mm -hmm. So you did an interesting study, but you were relating it to a climate change. Climate change, But yeah. I think maybe that we can, I mean, we can certainly talk about climate change, but I don't, you know, that's a long discussion. Um, but basically you found that, you know, potentially the increase in nighttime temperature is going to affect people's sleep. Yeah. So that implies that there's an optimal temperature. Yeah, I mean, one of the strongest signals for your brain that you're falling into sleep is a decrease in, in core body temperature, or, mm -hmm. or actually not the core body, but in your peripheral, in your peripheral systems. Mm -hmm. um, so what we showed uh, with Nick Obramovich was that um, Obramovich, Obramovich, um, Obramovich, uh, I think it's Obramovich, sorry, uh, is that... Um, he was looking at predictions of climate change and heat increases across the globe, and we were then predicting how much sleep loss would occur and in what groups. And what we found is that sleep loss would definitely occur, um, but specifically in people who were older and people who were poor because they have less climate control environments, right? Right. Um, but what he's gone on to do, which is really important, is that he's actually done it in real time. So now he has, because of Fitbit and all these different kinds of monitoring devices, um, he's able to look at how much people are sleeping on a day-to-day -day basis and look at the temperature in their area. Mm -hmm. And what he's finding is that when there's large heat waves, people decrease their sleep. Like their sleep actually just de decreases. And what's really important to think about is that even in long periods of heat waves, the body never adapts. 
that we have a set point for our body temperature and people is just their their sleep just is becomes chronic sleep loss yeah. like they never suddenly be like oh i'll just adjust my core body temperature so that now i can sleep with this higher temperature no that never happens yeah. you just have chronic states of sleep loss with more and more heat waves which is what's happening and what's that sleep loss look like is it just shortening of the sleep time period is it specific sleep stages go out of whack or um well because it's fitbit we don't really know but i think um i remember that i thought it was i i, I think that when i remember reading the study i my s assessment was that it was probably of the slow wave sleep variety because i think it was uh, later sleep onset times, mm. which as we now know right. is, is what's happening with slow sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So is there an optimal temperature that you know off the top of your head? That you're yeah. Like, I mean, people, it's sleep. somewhere between like 67 degrees and, you know, 69 degrees or something like that. I mean, that's probably a little bit even high, but somewhere in that range, yeah. that temperature of the room is supposed to be a good signal for sleep. Got it. What about light? Light is very important. You mentioned it before. Our circadian rhythm runs off of light, right? The sun yeah. comes up, time to get up. Sun goes down, time to chill out, go to yeah. bed. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on sunlight and other kinds of light, like blue light? Well, I mean, I think that light is is one of the most important regulators of our. Uh, it's our. It's a most natural regulator of our circadian rhythm in our sleep, mm -hmm. and it is the biggest you know, poison, uh, or I would say it's the biggest sort of destroyer of our natural rhythm because now we've harnessed its power to basically take away our natural rhythms or to um, confuse our natural rhythms. So, so, our, so the way our system, you know, that all uh, many, many circadian rhythm systems work is that um, we are sensitive to the different spectrum that, our, that natural light gives us. And sort of the beginning of the circadian upstate is the marker of it is the type of light that we get in the morning, which has a lot of blue light in it. Mm -hmm. And that sends goes through the retina and it sends signals to the superchiasmatic magnetic nucleus that it's time for the upstate, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's morning time. Yeah. Every It's like the conductor, ding, 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 start, right? right? Um, and so all your systems are regulated by this burst of blue light that comes into your eyes. Um, and then naturally, across the day, the sun goes from having blue in it to having no blue in it, and the spectrum changes to warmer lights, like oranges and reds. Mm -hmm. um, and that signal of no blue light is the signal for the onset of melatonin. Mm -hmm. So those are that's kind of the natural state of things. And when we were using older light bulbs, right, the tungsten light bulbs, those light bulbs were actually they shared the spectrum of sunset mm. so they didn't have any blue light in them they're very much like firelight like they had the warms yellows and reds and so for a long long time we were able to use light and not necessarily mess with our circadian rhythm that much even though people were obviously staying awake longer and working longer and that's part of you know the industrial revolution was like creating longer hours of work real quick let me interrupt you was that on purpose that they made light like that or was it completely coincidental? I think it was coincidental. I okay. don't think that this was in any... Yeah, there's no way that... No way. You know, because this is all very new very, news. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is the LEDs, their main uh, um, uh, peak of their s sensitivity is in the blue, blue light spectrum, yeah. right? So what you find is when you have, you know, cells in the, in the suprachiasmic nucleus they will respond to blue light and not even green light. You mm -hmm. know, you'll, like really specific spectrum um, will either inhibit melatonin or, or, or let melatonin um, get released. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, the LEDs are a problem because this is where, like, every parking lot, every hotel, all the screens, right, they're filled with these LEDs because they're super highly efficient, but they're also screwing with our natural systems and... Um, so now we're in a state where we're, t you know, really have these messed up sleep, wake and arousal systems. Mm. Now, when it comes to phones, I think that's a big issue, right? It's like everyone's on their phone and at night, you know, checking social media, doing whatever it is that they're doing. Based off of that, I mean, like when, when do you stop using your phone? Well, 
there are, I mean, you know, you could stop using your phone at 6 p.m., but that's, no one's going to do that. Right. So, so there are some, you know, the blue light blocking glasses that mm -hmm. are like, you know, the one that I actually like, and I, and I have no stake in this company, but they actually have research, and I do think that their research is pretty robust, is the Swanwick glasses, and the Swanwick glasses are yellow lenses, mm -hmm. and they block blue light, and I use them, and um, because the research is there, that it, they really do, you know, in decrease sleep fragmentation, and they seem to increase well-being um, during the day. So I think that you know you can, st you know, if, if if it's impossible to not use screens, then you really need to be using screens under blue light blue blocking light. conditions. Yeah, Swanwick. Yeah. Can you spell that? Swan like the bird. Wick. W i c k. All right. Awesome. Swan Wick. Support the pod. <laughs> That's right. Send us some product. <laughs> um, so, but you mentioned melatonin, though. Yeah. Um, do you, what do you think about melatonin supplementation for people at night that are having difficulty sleeping? You know, I mean, I think in general, I'm not against melatonin as a supplement. I think that people are just completely unregulated in how they're taking it. You know, it's almost impossible. When melatonin was not so popular, you could only find it in one milligram doses, mm -hmm. at most three milligram doses, right? Now you cannot find it in one milligram doses. It's at, it's usually in 10 milligrams, yeah. sometimes 50 milligram doses, which is insane. There's no one needs to take that much melatonin. And, right. and now, you know, people are taking it at all ages. And, um, so, you know, I, I'm not against melatonin. I think, uh, Definitely, our melatonin levels decrease as we get older. Um, so, if it does, if it's a supplement that works for some people, great. But they should be starting at one milligram mm -hmm. and see how it works over, say, a week. It's not a sleeping pill. It's not gonna. It's not the kind of thing you take it and you go to bed and you don't get out of bed or you're gonna like crash your car. Yeah. Um, you can take it when melatonin release starts to happen, a couple hours before your bedtime to get yourself at, you know, that, that, that would be the way I would take it, right? Is to take it before bedtime, a couple hours before bedtime, so that it's at its high, at high level when it should be at a high level later, yeah. right? So it's like a slow release. Right, that's a great point. Because I know people say melatonin didn't work for me. I took it and went to bed and my, it's not my ambient. sleep was still crappy. That's not the way, it doesn't work that way. It's just a, it, it, it just is a system that says, Okay, let's just slowly decrease our arousal. Right, it's right. sunset time, right, you know, yeah. and th and that's what it's doing. It's sending sleeping vibes. Yeah. It's not hitting you over the head. Sleepy vibes. That's the next name of your book, <laughs> I think. Sleepy vibes. You can write that. Book. <laughs> um. So another thing, another cool thing that I've seen that you're doing is uh, transcranial electrical stimulation for sleep. Yeah. The idea is, can you create an electrical signal that mimics the slow wave? Mm, okay. And send that into the brain when it's maybe in a transition state, like maybe it's in stage two sleep. Can you induce it into a deeper state of sleep by sending slow waves into the brain? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the whole idea is really, can we increase the things that help people with memory processing. Right. If we can do that with electrical stimulation, awesome. We can increase slow waves that way. Maybe we can increase it in older adults and maybe that will help them. But we can also, maybe we could do it, we've done with pharmacology, we've done it with brain stimulation. Maybe there's people who use auditory stimulation where they just send a little pulse of pink noise mm -hmm. and that does a little, arous it's interesting because it actually does a little bit of a, brain arousal response but not mu it doesn't wake you up but it sends enough that it actually creates a slow wave in mm. the brain and those increases in slow waves are actually associated with better learning when people wake up so that was what we showed with TES but you can do it with all d whatever you can do to increase the slow waves will hopefully then increase that memory processing um, and the question is, is in, we've definitely shown it in young adults that it works. 
the question is whether it actually will work in older adults. And um, that's what we don't know. You know, we don't, we don't know whether um, these interventions will work as well in older adults. Like if, if, if their system, it's like, I think of the brain as, as kind of a use it or lose it, right? So if the system hasn't been used very much, and, and if it has this long period of sort of like, you know, poor sleep, so it has some sort of buildup or some congestion in there. You know, maybe these slow waves aren't going to be able to do the trick, right? So that's that's where we need to start looking. Yeah. Have you found the connection between uh, any sort of modulation that increases slow wave then improves heart rate variability or any sort of measure of the restorative function outside of slow wave? No, right. I hear what you're saying. No, we have not looked at stimulation uh, treatments that usually are impacting slow waves and seen whether they've impacted the heart rate variability. But that would definitely be the next thing to do for sure. Interesting. Yeah. What about sleep aids? I've seen you've done a little bit of research on... Um, Ambien. Z yeah, Zolpidem. Zolpidem. Yeah. What are your thoughts on sleep aids? I've used them as experimental tools um, because Ambien increases sleep spindles. Right. So we've used them to look at the role of sleep spindles in memory processing. And what we found is, um, wow, you know, better memory right. um, with Ambien. And that's interesting. So cognition is complicated. Uh, so the executive function that we've been talking about uh, goes on in the front frontal lobe, mm -hmm. but the memories that we were talking about, about like, you know, remember um, this story I told you, I'm going to ask you the next day yeah. and get sleep. That's actually not about executive function. That's about actually memorizing specific information, right? Mm -hmm. Holding on to memories. So what sleep spindles are helpful for are those memories holding on to specific bits of information because they they suppose the idea is that they're helping increase the looping through the hippocampus and the cortex mm -hmm. and just that reactivation of the memories right. what's also interesting is that we've found that there's a trade-off um and it's specifically related to hiv is that ambien decreases um hiv mm -hmm. it decreases parasympathetic activity during sleep mm -hmm. um, and it decreases executive function so this is a scientific thought um, which is that we have different pathways so that, that sleep is a limited resource system right we only have so many slow waves we only have so many sleep spindles we only have so much parasympathetic boosting of activity and everything that you need to do overnight needs to use some of those resources mm -hmm. So those memories that we want to hold on to, they're going to use some resources at the cost of another system. Um, they're not sharing resources. I mean, they are sharing resources, but in terms of, you know, if I take a piece of pie out, that pie now has a missing piece, right? right? right. So, so what we're finding is that there's actually a trade-off between the parasympathetic activity that goes on during slow wave sleep and that executive function benefit and the sleep spindle activity that goes on during slow wave sleep um, and the benefits to long-term memory. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, what about dreams? What do you think about dreams specifically? Do you think that's part of the executive functioning? Do you think that's part of an element of maybe some of the memory stuff going on? Do you think it's maybe a state of uh, a restorative state? What do you think that is? So as far as we know, which is very, very little about dreams, it's, you know, it's a really amazingly interesting and it's been fascinating humans. Our whole, you know, the history of humans, we've been looking at our dreams and trying to understand what the hell's going on. And there's every possible, you know, hypothesis about what dreams are for. Um, so the research that me and my colleagues have done on those are really trying to stick in the stay in the realm of cognition mm -hmm. um, and what we're finding is that uh, 
um, this is work by Aaron Wamsley, um, is that it's likely that when you're dreaming about something, it's part of the memory consolidation process, right. right? That it is some sort of reflection of a reactivation of your memories. Um, because what she's shown is that when people dream about, say, walking through a maze, that they were, they, you know, doing a virtual maze on a computer game, and then when they dream about those mazes, they do better on on, on the maze when they wake up. So that's number one. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. It's really. That's cool. That's not just a number one. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So they they'll train in a virtual maze mm -hmm. when they're awake, dream about the maze, mm -hmm. and then do better when they're tested the on the maze the next day. The people who dreamed about the maze were the ones who did better. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. What's number two? Number two is that there is this idea that we may also be doing some emotional processing mm -hmm. um, because dreams are highly emotional mm -hmm. and we are when we're in a REM brain state, our frontal lobe is actually pretty much shut down, mm -hmm. right? So we're in this kind of highly emotional, really motivated, intense, disinhibited. Um, yeah. disinhibited state where we are going through all these different memories and there's a lot of random firing in the brain and you're kind of bringing up things that recently happened with things that happened a long time ago, right. like dreaming about dead people mm -hmm. interacting with live people mm -hmm. and very nonlinear and non-logical. But somehow, as we said, those things that happened during that period may also be help helping us with creativity, right? So we're, so we're making connections that we wouldn't otherwise make during waking because during waking we have a system that says, that's dumb. Right. She's dead. There's right. no way she'd be playing cards right. with this guy you just met, right? Like right. it doesn't make any sense. So, but in dream time, we can actually experience that fanciful thing. And, you know, maybe there's some idea that we are sort of troubleshooting or, or working out potential hypothesis, hypothesis testing. Yeah. You know, like, well, what, ha what would happen if this happened? Well, what, you know, how would I feel about this? Or, you know, kind of looping through situations over and over again to see. Um, to try to figure them out. Um, the other idea is that across uh, many bouts of REM sleep, what you're doing is every time you reinstate that memory, you're having a less and less and less of an emotional response to it because you're disengaging the amygdala from that memory. So you're leaving the memory there as a core memory, but less and less emotional tone is, is associated with that memory. Um, and that may also be happening. And, you know, and, and so, so there's a lot of different ideas around, but we don't have, we don't have any answers so, in the same way that we have answers for non rem sleep. So disengaging the emotional tone to an experience sounds very therapeutic. Yeah. Um, have you been finding that throughout sleep and throughout the stages of sleep where you find that REM becomes more and more prominent? that emotional tone decreases? Yeah. And if so, how do you how do you find how do you see that? So you'll show people emotional things, like emotional experiences that they're supposed to emotional pictures, mm -hmm. emotional movies or something and and then emotional stories um and you have them rate how they feel about them. Mm -hmm. Um and later then you test them on their memory for the in information and then also how they feel about them. Mm -hmm. And what you sometimes find is that their memory gets stronger where their emotional feelings get less intense. After you know that they've dreamed about it in their sleep. That's the part that we don't really know about. We just know that after they sleep, that's that seems to be the outcome. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to tie this in, but it sounds very similar to some of the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. Yeah. You know? Oh, I think psychedelics have a huge potential yeah that are really really interesting yeah it's very striking yeah that's a rabbit hole that we can't go down because <laughs> we only have like 10 minutes left in this thing so given the fact that we just have 10 minutes left in yeah. this thing i want to go over your recovery plus plan oh, okay, great. for people i think that's really important and uh, a great takeaway that people can take from this so uh you want to start explaining what the recovery plus plan is yeah so i mean just the term recovery plus is this idea that the more time you spend in the downstate, the more you're building up those resources to get you ready for the next upstate. Mm. And that if you shorten the downstate, you're just going to recover. But if you, if you, and that's fine, you'll get back to your baseline. But if you give yourself more time in the downstate, 
you'll actually produce more replenishment of those nutrients and resources so that the next time you have an upstate, you'll you'll be able to recover beyond that and go to plus, right? right. You'll, you'll be able to like ratchet up your, your performance. Right. So the recovery plus plan was really um, a way of, sorry, the, the whatever, that's autonomic sleep, exercise, nutrition, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and it's a way to just sort of organize people's behavior so that they could try to do one thing per domain mm -hmm. for each week. Right. So it's a four-week thing, but it could be a four-month thing. It could be a four-season thing. Like it really just depends on how long people take to create a habit out of each action item. So if you just, um, you can actually just, you know, go four All times. Of them? Yeah, why not? So the point is that, you know, on the first week, you're going to try something from the autonomic uh, domain. Sure. And I call these action items, but there's about seven that I put in the book. Okay. Um, and what this is, is like, just choose one. Just choose the easiest one mm -hmm. that you can bring into your life and start doing it on a daily basis, right? And, it, you know, we talked about the slow, deep breathing. Nasal breathing is a big part of it, right? But doing slow, deep breathing 10 minutes a day, just do that for a week and, and start creating a habit at the same time of day. You know, you could do five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night. You could do 10 minutes in the evening, whatever it is. Just start that process. And nasal is important because you're stimulating the olfactory bulb, which goes back to the limbic system, or is it different than that? Well, I mean, there is some real benefits, cognitive benefits to nasal breathing, but it really is because nasal breathing is, is there's a book called um, Breath by James Nestor. Highly That's recommend. so funny. Someone just recommended it to me. Oh, yeah, it's um, great. The other day. Yeah. He actually put the, the quote on the front of the book because I was so inspired by him. I said, hey, man. <laughs> so, um, uh, so nasal breathing is better than mouth breathing because nasal breathing on a very simple level, there's a whole bunch of more stuff he has to say about it, but on a very simple level, it slows down your breathing rate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's an easier way for you to match your respiration and your heart rate. It also creates a filter through your nose, mm -hmm. um, to to basically filter the air. It gives you moist air rather than the dry air that you get through your mouth, so it's better to decrease asthma. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a way healthier way of breathing, and it's kind of a lost art yeah. that we really should try to re-engage, and there's all sorts of cognitive benefits that shown from nasal breathing over mouth breathing. Got it. Um, so slow, deep nasal breathing might be the first thing you do. The second week, you're gonna choose something from the sleep aisle, and you know, early to bed is an, is is one that we've already talked about why that's beneficial yeah. because it's going to increase your slow wave sleep. Mm -hmm. So then you got those two things going. On the next week, you might choose something from the exercise. And for and this really exercise is obviously something that it depends on who you are, right? You could be somebody who really never exercises. So all you need to do is just do the recommended dosage of exercise, which is. 30 minutes, three times a week, do something. Yeah. Take a walk, do something. Yeah. Or you could choose something from like an expertise aisle and say, well, I'm going to start using HRV to determine my workout routine, yeah. right? That's, yeah. a, that's a real advanced exercise right. person. So you could choose. Then you choose. And so then you have got three weeks going. In the fourth week, you go into the nutrition. Maybe you choose eat breakfast because that's something that's easy to do. And, you know, you know that that's when your metabolism at its height and you can jumpstart your upstate by eating go for it, mm. right? Then you eat breakfast. Okay. If that's too bad for you or, ha you know, start doing some other kind of fasting thing. So it's basically just a system that if you could get these things running, you know, on all four cylinders, you would really have this really strong downstate plan. Right. And then as you get better and better, you could add more things. Yeah. This is excellent. And Thanks. I think, I mean, it's, uh, I, I love the fact that it's, uh, it provides people with autonomy, right? Yeah. And, um, and you've mentioned this before in your book, and I totally agree that um, medicine is reactionary, right? It's not necessarily preventative. And um, although I think we're headed, we're headed in that direction. Just had a conversation with um, uh, Dr. Geshwin, like I said, and we were talking about precision medicine, which you know, it's a little bit more preventative than reactionary, which is great. Yeah. So um, yeah, this stuff is is amazing. I saw consensual physical connection. Sex. Is, okay. That's, I was like, is that what I think it is? Okay. Got it. Yes. I mean, it's yeah. also holding hands and have, getting hugs, but really sex is really great for downstate. I love the consensual part. Yes. Don't hug people without 
Well, there's no nothing sense. worse for an upstate spike or a, right. or a stress for, response right, than person. having unwanted right, touch, right. right? This has to be fully consensual right. to get you that feeling of safety and love, but also, you know, that's a sympathetic schwitz if there ever was one, right? Exactly. And then you go into this, like, really big, absolutely yeah. major downstate of yeah. not being able to do anything. Yeah, and don't, in addition to being concerned about your own upstate and downstate, you should also be concerned about eliciting a massive upstate in other people. Absolutely. Don't do that. Absolutely. Try not to do that. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Dr. Mednick, thank you so much for coming. Um, I told you, and I don't know if it was on the recording, but I've been listening to the power of the downstate oh, yeah. uh, on audible. It's you on the, on the, on the recording. Right? On the recording. recording? I, I read Sounds it. amazing. Thank you. It's amazing thus far. I think I'm, I don't know. I think I'm through like the first part. There's three parts. Um, and I think it's awesome. Um, written so well, uh, done so well from beginning to end. I so really I'd recommend everybody it. to go check it out. Thank you. Um, do you have anything else that you want to, you know, promote, talk about before we, uh, I mean, people can find me on Twitter. Yeah. I write on medium. Um, and yeah, that's my external persona. Yeah. 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 So reach out to you on Twitter if they have any questions or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that sounds good. Did you say what your Twitter handle was or no? Sarah underscore Mednick. Okay. I also have a website, Sarah Mednick, and my email is there in case you have questions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right, everybody. A pleasure having Dr. Sarah Mednick on. Thank you so much. I learned so much. Um, I hope you come back because there's plenty more to talk about. Yeah, that's sure. For sure. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Most importantly, stay safe, be well, and embrace the downstate. Ha, ha, ha.